How you doing? I'm doing all right. All right. <laughs> um, I wanted to start with a kind of broad focus question. So the impeachment that you managed garnered more votes for conviction than any other in history. Presidential. Impeachment. Presidential, yeah. Right, there have been a few judges who are kind of footnotes to history. But I think, I think established among, you know, a consensus even among those who voted to acquit the president that Donald Trump had worked to violently resist the peaceful transfer of power, which is about as fundamental and offensive to our shared values, Democrat, Republican, independent, just as Americans, as we've seen at least since the Civil War. Yet less than four years later, here he is vying for the presidency. Uh, a New York Times article from a couple of days ago asks, do Americans have a collective amnesia about Donald Trump? So, um, a tough one that I don't think you can solve sitting here, but what are your thoughts? How has a man who perpetrated such an offense to bedrock American values reemerged as very possibly our next president? Um, well, let's start with this. The, the vote in the Senate was 57 to 43. Um, and so we had to explain to the to four- To convict. To convict Donald Trump. And we had to explain to all the foreign reporters why that was a loss. And it's yeah. because um, the Constitution requires two thirds to convict. So I like to say that Donald Trump beat the constitutional spread uh, <laughs> by 10 votes. And yet still we did have the most sweeping bipartisan vote to convict and robust bipartisan, bicameral majorities in the House and the Senate to determine as a matter of legislative and constitutional fact that he incited an insurrection against the Constitution. And sometimes people think that the insurrection was just the mob violence that was unleashed against our police and against Congress and against uh, his own vice president that day. That was just the culmination of a process in which he tried to overthrow the Constitution and involved going to the legislatures to try to get them to nullify the popular vote and just to decree pro-Trump electoral college slates. It involved direct phone calls and overtures, more than uh, two dozen of them, to people like Brad Raffensperger, the Secretary of State in Georgia, to say, just find me 11,780 votes. You know, I'm a politician. Find me 11,780 <laughs> votes. You know, that wasn't Donald Trump. EOJ. Uh, the, trying to the mini coup at the Department of Justice, and then finally uh, trying to get Vice President Pence to step outside of his constitutional role, which is ministerial and managerial uh, in nature under the 12th Amendment to the Constitution, and simply to declare Donald Trump um, the president. So um, you asked the question, why are we still here? Well, the historians, I think, have a pretty good answer for it, which is that... Um, the single biggest indicator of a successful coup coming is a recently failed coup uh, in which all the perpetrators have not been held to account. And the people who staged the coup or insurrection uh, have tried to pull the wool over everybody's eyes with propaganda and disinformation. So uh, we're in the, still in the thick of the fight of our lives right now. Um, there have been... Uh, more than 800 uh, convictions of people who are uh, felons now for having assaulted federal officers, destroyed federal property, uh, interfered with a federal proceeding, or engaged in um, seditious uh, conspiracy, which means conspiracy to overthrow the government of the United States or to put it down. Uh, the president today also in... Um, that Valentine that he sent mm -hmm. to Liz Cheney and me and the other members of the committee. Um, he also uh, described these people as um, these convicted felon insurrectionists who assaulted our officers. He's described them as hostages, uh, which in addition to everything else is uh, an obscene ab affront and offense to the families still of more than 135 people being held hostage by Hamas uh, today. A hostage is a person who's been illegally abducted by a terrorist or criminal entity and held for a financial and political ransom. That's got nothing to do with people who've had every constitutional right under due process granted to them uh, and then are convicted of crimes that they voluntarily committed against their own country. And by the way, a majority of them uh, pled guilty 
to it, and yet they continue to describe them as hostages or political prisoners like Alexei Navalny or Nelson Mandela. Um, so from my perspective, uh, this goes way beyond uh, political party or policy differences. The question is whether we're going to continue as a constitutional democracy. And my friend Liz Cheney is out there telling people, if, if you vote in that direction in this election, it will likely be the last vote you get to cast in a democratic election. And um, a lot of people who are refugees from Trump land feel the same way, like Michael Cohen um, and Cassidy Hutchinson. Um, the people who know the situation from the best from the inside see this as an absolute threat to the continuation of the kind of government we have. The good news, I will tell you, is that the vast majority of the people stand on the side of democracy and freedom. They really do. And uh, what we're up against is just a bag of tricks, like the gerrymandering of our state and federal districts, uh, voter suppression tactics, the filibuster, um, using you know, the Supreme Court or uh, packed federal court judicial activism to shut down um, the real constitutional process. So we've got to reclaim the forward motion of democracy in America. You know, Tocqueville in Democracy in America observed that democracy and voting rights in our country are either shrinking and shriveling away or they're growing and expanding. And it's time for us to get American democracy back on the growth track. So. <clears throat> Let me follow up with the American democracy point you made. Uh, to many of us, Trump seemed this singular figure who came out of nowhere, but his ascent dovetailed with the rise of autocracy in many countries in the world. What is it about this moment in history that is bringing so many countries to flirt with autocracy? Or is it maybe the reverse and Trump somehow just sensed and connected to the mood of the times? It's not just here at home. Well, there are a number of convergent trends around the world. Um, I, I won't say that over-determined the rise of Donald Trump, but certainly supported the rise of Donald Trump. And the biggest one in my mind, and this is perhaps the thing that we did not emphasize enough in our final report of the January 6th committee, um, is uh, the internet and social media, um, which has allowed extremist groups and individuals, one, to find each other all over the place, to work together on a global basis, um, to uh, spread propaganda, disinformation, big lies around the world, around the country, and then to coordinate like January 6th, which was a, uh, a very well-orchestrated, well-choreographed um, hit on the U.S. Congress and the Capitol where uh, it was staged like a, a military yeah. campaign. Um, and so I... Uh, you know, we have some of that in our report, but uh, I think that we need to take very seriously what's going on um, with uh, social media. And it's not that propaganda is new or disinformation is new or the big lie is new. All of these are uh, well-rehearsed uh, tropes and mechanisms from the last century. It's just they're supercharged on the Internet and the social media where the propaganda is instantaneous uh, the disinformation is deep, right? Um, didn't, uh, was it Mark Twain who said the, the, a lie can get halfway around the world before the truth can get its shoes on? Right. That was before the internet, right? That was before social media. And so it's very hard to dislodge it. Look, we had 60 federal and state court judgments decreeing that the election was a perfectly fair, valid election, rejecting every claim of electoral fraud and electoral corruption, and yet still today you've got millions of Americans who are willing to just go out and say with no evidence at all, oh yeah, the 2020 election was stolen. So that's a lie, and it was a lie that was constructed for the purposes of a traitorous attack on our Constitution. I want to drop a sort of nerdy footnote because we talked about it yesterday. Just this morning, the Supreme Court heard argument. We haven't followed it so closely, but there's a battle afoot to try to permit 
the big lie and misinformation to flourish on social media. So the government made efforts uh, to correct, persuade is how they put it, some of the big media companies in the wake of COVID to say, hey, you know, it's serious and bleach won't cure it. Uh, uh, hey, the, here's what happened with the election. And there's a well-organized bunch of litigators who are in the Supreme Court this morning saying that's a violation of our free speech rights. You know, you, you have your view on COVID, we have ours, and you, government, can't try to persuade social media folks. That's going to be just in the social media realm, but more broadly in this battle, pretty. Um, I, I, see, I see a sort of Cheshire cat snicker here. What do you... Well, no, I'm just I'm remembering... Uh, <laughs> yeah. One day when my um, esteemed colleagues, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert, uh, <laughs> were on the floor and making this argument, yeah. like who is the government to try to correct social media right. if somebody's put up a website saying the election is on Tuesday between 3 and 6, right. uh, or it's Saturday between 8 and 4. And the fact is, media companies are now shying away from doing it because they're getting sued right and left by organized yeah. sort of groups, yeah. But I mean, if you think about it, that is such a fundamental attack on the rule of law. Yeah. We have an entire justice system that's based on the idea of facts and evidence. That's why we have the criminal standard of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. We have the civil standard of proof by preponderance of the evidence. We believe that there are facts that are knowable, that are empirically identifiable, and we use them in order to render judgments. And they want to say, well, you know, if Vladimir Putin now uses artificial intelligence to put up 50,000 websites telling everybody that the election is next Friday instead of this Tuesday, the government can't even notify Facebook or Twitter or the public that the First Amendment, they're violating the First Amendment by forcing that, yeah. speech on, right, exactly. But it's, of course, it's not an enforcement of speech. If you want to believe uh, that the election is next Saturday, you can tell people that if you want to, but isn't it the role of government to tell people when the election is? I mean, you would think... Or if bleach um, helps COVID, you know. Yes. Yeah. Well, well, th there we go. Um, so, I, you know, yeah. I, m m my dad once said... Uh, that democracy needs a ground to stand on, and that ground is the truth. Um, and if we're gonna have democratic government in politics, we, we can't lose our belief in the truth and our ability to arrive at it, at least about very simple things. I can see where you got your moral clarity. So, um, okay. I, you know, I wanna go back to this point you made about people still continuing to believe, say, the election was stolen. It breaks down. It's the, there's a majority of the Republican Party that now will, uh, says that in polls. And it just strikes me that any serious diagnosis of what ails us as a country has to zero in on the role of your colleagues in the Republican Party that you know are utterly in Trump's thrall and afraid to defy him. Um, to me, it seems hard to return to a healthy democratic system that doesn't include a reinvigoration of the Republican Party as a party. I, you know, you're a Democrat, but there's real American value in having a party that has ideas and conservative principles and the like, rather than Fox News talking points and grievance and the, some of the people you mentioned. So any sense, what's gotta happen for the GOP to well, just return to its integral place in uh, functioning? But remember, the, the Republican Party started off as a third party. Yeah. It replaced the Whigs. It was an upstart party, and there's nothing to say well, the, the Demo Republican Party can't yeah. be replaced, and there's nothing to say the Democratic Party can't be replaced. Sometimes I'm a persona non grata in my party because I'm opposed to all of the duopolistic exclusionary mechanisms the two parties put in together to keep out yeah. Third parties. I believe in competition in politics and economics and sports. So did the and, and so did the founders, right? That and was the their founders vision. did too. And yeah. and it also. Um, so I think the Republican Party can and probably should be replaced at this point. And I've you know challenged Liz Cheney and Mitt Romney and those guys. Yeah. Create. We need a real a real conservative party yeah. in America, not a party of. Uh, charlatans and nihilists and authoritarians, you know, um, and it gives me no delight or joy to say that. I've got the the bust of one president in my office since Abraham Lincoln, and I will read anything that anybody ever writes about Lincoln. Um, but he created 
the Republican Party as a party of freedom and a party of union and uh, an anti-know-nothing, anti-conspiracy theory, pro-truth and pro-science and pro-reason political party. And they've reduced it to an authoritarian cult of personality. Um, and, you know, the political scientists tell us what the hallmarks of an authoritarian or a fascist political party are. One, they refuse to accept the results of democratic elections that don't go their way. Two, they refuse to disavow or they openly embrace political violence as an instrument of obtaining and retaining political power. Three, they're organized around a charismatic or allegedly charismatic uh, uh, <laughs> leader whose word and whose views are elevated above the rule of law and above the Constitution. And then they use scapegoating and hatred and racism and anti-Semitism uh, in order to mobilize people. Everybody got mad at President Biden when he said that there were semi-fascist currents in the Republican yeah. Party. I'm sorry, if the shoe semi-fits, you semi-wear it. <laughs> so, um, um, by the way, I wanted to thank everyone. If you if you hear your handiwork and some of the questions I asked, that's because many people submitted questions, some really good ones, and I felt completely the liberty to plagiarize them. So uh, you'll you'll as you'll you'll know who you are when when we talk about them. Um, wanted to turn a little bit to your own work historically f before getting to current day in Congress. Uh, the let's start with the impeachment. Um, you know, you chronicled it in Unthinkable. For those of you who haven't read it, and I hope they are very few in, in this room, it describes in uh, eloquent and searing terms what to readers feels like a sort of unbearable weight of the public world, you know, combined with an equally even more unbearable weight of your own and your family's world with the loss of your son. I, I just want to quote from your, from Unthinkable, who had a perfect heart, a perfect soul, a riotously courageous and relentless sense of humor, and a dazzling, radiant mind. We get the sense from the book that the private loss, though, Congressman, rather than pushing you to withdraw from life, actually fueled your public duties and gave greater sort of force and focus to your voice as impeachment manager. It, look, is that, is that accurate? And what was your mindset during that period? Well, um, you know, I, I didn't really distinguish. I don't know how any of us really distinguish between our public life and our private life. Um, yeah. And... Um, Certainly, Tommy and all my kids have been very engaged in public things and political things. And um, um, we lost Tommy on the very last day of 2020. And um, I'm sure you will all remember that also as a very dark and despondent year with COVID-19. And, um, and I view that plague upon the land and then the additional plague of such lethal recklessness and irresponsibility and indifference in the government as setting the stage for so much of the nightmare to follow. And, um, and Tommy was a second year student at Harvard Law School when COVID hit. Um, and uh, they sent everybody home. Um, and it was such an isolating and demoralizing time for young people as it still is. We're in a youth mental and emotional health crisis across the country. Word. Um, yeah. yeah, it's very tough time still. Um, but um, for someone who's already struggling with depression, um, well, it was just overwhelming. And I, I probably can't go into it too yeah. much more depth without uh, yeah. losing my composure here. But anyway, I tell the story of that. But I, I saw the... Um, the assault on the election and the assault on the Constitution and the democracy is very consistent with what took place during COVID, which I describe as America's collapse into something very close to a failed state. And the political scientists tell us that a failed state is one that cannot deliver the basic goods of existence to its people. Um, and uh, public health is obviously a central good and so here we are, the wealthiest country in the world at its wealthiest moment in history, 
Um, and there are, you know, civilian strife, if not civil war, strife over simple things like should we wear a mask or is it okay for people uh, to get the vaccine? And there's all kinds of propaganda and lies about just inject yourself with bleach or hydroxychloroquine or whatever it is. And um, so, so I suppose... You know, when, you know, Pelosi asked me to lead the impeachment managers and and the fight on the floor and everything, and I didn't really see myself as having any other choice, you know? I just, you know, I felt we were in the fight of our lives, and I still feel it today. My feelings have not changed, and I feel Tommy's with me. Um, let's move to your to the uh, a second large act here. Um, fall in your you served on the January sixth select committee, and I, I don't know if people remember, but at the time there was so much misinformation and debate about just what had happened. Not to mention marshalling all the kinds of witnesses. It really seemed to, you know, even beyond um, bringing accountability to the offenders just having some kind of official account of what the hell happened seemed like a critical and then kind of missing piece. So you guys did exhaustively document the conspiracy to overturn the election. Looking back a year and a half since the report's release, what would you see today as the legacy of the committee's work? Well, I think we heard about it this morning. I mean, I I, I don't think... um... You know, our friend Mr. Trump would be so upset with the committee um, had we not done our job and told the truth to America. Um, And they've not laid a glove on the report. They've not found one single factual inaccuracy. Um, You know, sometimes they're out there saying, uh, well, no, it was really Antifa. Antifa that did it. Of course, we didn't find any evidence of Antifa's presence. It, It It always cracks me up that half the time they're saying Antifa and the FBI really did it, and the other half of the time they're down at the D.C. jail protesting for the release of Antifa and the FBI agents who they say are in there. Um, And uh, and, uh, Trump today described them as great heroes and patriots and so on. But um, they've not been able in any way to uh, challenge the report of what happened and... It was not only our first violent insurrection uh, that directly hit the Capitol, because that didn't even happen during the Civil War, um, but it was also the most documented violent insurrection in American history, maybe world history, because everybody was filming. All these jokers brought there, right? Yeah, and people were bragging about it, and they were very excited about it. Yeah. Um, And so we were able to doc, you know, and. the, Mike Johnson and uh, Jim Jordan and those guys were saying, oh, you know, you didn't release all of the videotape. The videotape that wasn't released was basically of a hallway on the second floor of the Longworth House office building where nothing happened for hours and hours and hours. And that's, you know, so we just released everything. And you know what? They didn't come back to challenge a single thing. Right. Then they dropped it after they got all the videotapes. Did you hear anybody get up and say, Oh, we found the big smoking gun. You know, uh, no, it never happened. Um, we were able to document what happened. And, and we all saw Trump's speech where he got up and he said, you got to go and you got to fight like hell. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. And when there's fraud involved, it's a whole different set of rules. And I'll be there with you. And I'm going there with you. Um, and 150 of our officers ended up with broken arms, broken legs, broken noses, heart attacks, strokes. Uh, Many of them had to leave policing, like Sergeant Connell can no longer be an officer because of his injuries to his his left foot, his right arm. Officers who can't raise their arms um, anymore, post-traumatic stress syndrome. And we've got people calling the insurrectionists who did that heroes and hostages, the people who attacked our officers and tried to overthrow our 
Constitution. So that tells us what we're up against. But you know, people say, well, how can the country still be so split? And I always think back to, to Tom Paine, you know, who came over in 1774, two years before the American Revolution. He fell in love with America. You know, he said, if this country lived up to its ideals, it would become an asylum to humanity. Not an insane asylum, <laughs> you, okay? But a place of refuge for people fleeing political and religious and economic oppression. But, and he wrote Common Sense, which was the document that launched the American Revolution. But even in 1776, he was saying, half the people are wandering around saying, you can't beat a king. You can't really beat a king. The king will do anything. You can't beat a queen. You can't beat the royalty. You can't beat the fusion of church and state. And so he, he wrote uh, this great pamphlet called The Crisis. Uh, and, uh, and I love this passage. And uh, whenever I speak it, uh, Nancy Pelosi tells me I've got to update the language so it doesn't offend modern sensibilities, because she said Paine was a feminist and that he was. And so, but anyway, he said, these are the times that try men and women's souls. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, the, the summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will shrink at this moment from the service of their cause in their country. But everyone that stands with us now will win the love and the favor and the affection of every man and every woman for all time. Tyranny like hell is not easily conquered, but we have this saving consolation. The more difficult the struggle, the more glorious in the end will be our victory. So I think about that all the time, so. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I know you're a Shakespeare buff, and it reminds a lot of St. Crispin's speech from Henry, the he who stands with me, yeah, he or she who stands with me today. <laughs> um, all right, let's talk about the Supreme Court. One of, you know, it's been a lifetime, um, uh, pa you know, passion and um, vocation for you as a con law professor. Um, a few big cases out there. We actually crossed paths at the Colorado insurrection uh, case, and that's... <laughs> I'm you know. glad you completed that sentence. And so uh, I think everyone knows that one's a case involving the 14th Amendment provision that says anyone who has sworn an oath and then proceeded to help or engage in insurrection is no longer um, uh, qualified to hold, the same as being under under 35, same as being foreign born, you're not qualified as one of the few in the Constitution to hold high federal office. Okay. Engage in insurrection or rebellion. Yeah. Or give aid and comfort to those who are protected. All right. So definitely the feel, and you were there, I was there at the argument was they're not going for this. Uh, and we and <laughs> we kind of the and in fact it was more splintered than was reported in a way. But, you know, nine uh, members of the court um, didn't go for it, although this uh, really interesting little, again, nerdy footnote, the, uh, the Sotomayor concurrence, they rushed it out so quickly before Super Tuesday that uh, they didn't notice there was metadata still in there that demonstrated it had started life as a dissent. Um, but... Um, Look, but, you know, besides being one of the most prominent members of Congress, you spent a career as a con law professor. You're aware of the concerns that animated the court. What, what do you think about their concerns? And, you know, what should they have done? Justice Raskin. Well, <laughs> you know, I, I, I left academia for politics because I fell out of love with the Supreme Court. And I fell out of love with the Supreme Court a long time ago. And, um, you know, it's still got a little bit of a halo from that Warren Court period where the court really was on the side of the people and we got Brown versus Board and Roe versus Wade and Miranda versus Arizona, the white primary line of cases. But look, let's be honest. For the vast majority of American history, the Supreme Court has been a profoundly reactionary institution that really has not been on the side of the people. I mean, think about... The first century of our history, what did the Supreme Court ever do for enslaved people in the country? In the Dred Scott decision, it cemented the system of slavery into place. It said that the African and his descendants has no rights the white man is bound to respect. 
and defined the Constitution as a white man's compact. But then even after the Civil War in the Reconstruction Amendments, in 1896, 30 years later, in Plessy versus Ferguson, the Supreme Court constitutionalized Jim Crow apartheid in America. And then it's not until that war in court period with Brown versus Board that you get an overruling of Plessy and a few decades of a different kind of Supreme Court where you really could say that they were proclaiming the rights of the people. And then a whole bunch of decisions undercutting civil rights, undercutting desegregation, Milliken versus Bradley. Um, and you get um, the Burger Court, you get the Rehnquist Court, you get the Roberts Court. And I believe that we've retreated to that baseline. And so for me, um, I don't put my faith in the Supreme Court. I put my faith in the people. That's why I'm in politics, OK? And um, I, the, that, that uh, oral argument was an amazing thing because nothing could be clearer than Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. So everybody should go and read it. You know, anyone um, who has sworn an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution against enemies Check. foreign and domestic, who, uh, who participates in insurrection or rebellion or Check. renders aid and comfort to those did, shall never be allowed to hold federal or state office again. It's right there for people who want to be a textualist or for people who want to be an originalist. In fact, if you go back, the history of the clause is remarkable because when Thaddeus Stevens and the radical Republicans first brought it in to the House, it was much, much broader. It said anybody who participates in insurrection, either in the secession or in the future insurrection, shall be disenfranchised for life. She'll never be allowed to vote again, okay? And it got over to the Senate, and the Senate said, no, that's way too broad. It shouldn't be anybody who participates in insurrection, only the most culpable people who'd actually sworn an oath to uphold the Constitution before. And even in that case, like with Robert E. Lee or Jefferson Davis, we'll allow them to vote. We'll just never allow them to take public office again because they've already proven themselves to be untrustworthy. And Congress could remove it with a two-thirds vote even, then another escape then, valve, yeah. Even then, with two-thirds of a vote in Congress, it could be removed, which is what ended up happening with the amnesty after the Civil yep. War. After So well, then, you know, my colleagues get up or I watch on TV and they say, you know, how dare you deprive the people of their right to choose just one person uh, Donald Trump. And I say, well, let's start this way. More than 100 million people in America can't run for president, including people I sit next to in committee like Maxwell Frost, who's 28 years old, and AOC. I think AOC's 33 or 34. You got to be 35 to run for president. Is that unfair and undemocratic and unconstitutional? You got to be uh, a born U.S. citizen to run for president. So, um, you know, Jennifer Granholm, who was my law school classmate, who's in the cabinet, she can't run for president because she was a Canadian. Uh, your former governor, Schwarzenegger, he was born in uh, Austria, right? He was governor of our largest state. He can't run for president. Is that undemocratic? Well, maybe it's in the Constitution. If you don't like it, change the Constitution, right? And in fact, if you think about all of the categories of disqualification for running for president, the most defensible is that tiny category that applies to maybe a half dozen people, people who try to overthrow the government while they're in office, right? I mean, you can't control where you're born, and you can't control when you're born and your age, but you can control whether or not you try to send a mob to overthrow an election that you lost. So do I have a problem uh, disqualifying somebody under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment? Not at all. No, I don't. Mm. Mm. All right, and the message that the court said is it's up to Congress if they want to do it. And you're actually working on legislation that, that would effectuate the provision. Yes. Well, how would it work, and is there any chance at all of it well, having purchased, the, like, this year at the end of the, yeah. yeah? The clean way to do it, of course, would have been for the Supreme Court actually yeah. to do its job and interpret the Constitution because Section 3 of the 14th Amendment is a positive command 
it's self-actualizing like the rest of the 14th Amendment, the Equal Protection Clause is also self-actualizing. People can sue under the Equal Protection Clause without there being a federal statute passed, but the Supreme Court put us in a straitjacket and said Congress needs to act under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment. So I'm working on legislation to develop a judicial mechanism whereby either the Attorney General of the United States or a private citizen can assert that someone has participated in insurrection or rebellion and should be disqualified from an election that they're voting in. And, um, you know, I don't have a lot of high hopes that Mike Johnson's going to rush this to the floor or anything. Um, <laughs> but it, it is something that we obviously need now at this point, especially with all the propaganda out there saying that the Supreme Court found that Donald Trump was not an insurrectionist. That's not what they found. They said that the Supreme Court was not institutionally competent to make that judgment. It's up to Congress to decide. But they didn't overturn a single fact that had been found by the Colorado Supreme Court. Yeah. By the way, I also don't see this happening, but given what the court said, there is another mechanism, which is Congress has previously passed 2383, a, which is insurrection, and were the Department of Justice to charge Trump and prove Trump had engaged in that, he it would automatically um, disqualify him under the statute. And, uh, well, yes, but because it's also it would it would accord with what they said because Congress passed the statute. Yeah, but who look this? Okay, this Supreme Court <laughs> yeah. could very easily say yeah. in their uh, ceaseless acrobatics, well, that that wasn't adopted with sufficient due process to yeah. determine whether Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, so I, you know, should be right. uh, operative. So I, at, at this point... You'll believe it when you I put it. my faith yeah. in the people. <laughs> exactly. I put my faith in the people. Speaking of which, the ceaseless acrobatics, let's talk about one more case, the immunity case, uh, which is, we're not going to talk about my, the things I obsess over every day, the, the different criminal cases, um, but that's one where the court's action has served to delay... What is probably the most important, I would say, most goes to the sort of wickedness you've been talking about of January 6th, and now, because the court came in and decided to take the case, notwithstanding a very strong bipartisan opinion below rejecting the claim, we're on ice for another two, three months. So I, I just wonder your thoughts first about, you know, it took like almost two weeks of inner machinations that we don't know about if you have any thoughts about that, but also where you think the court might be going. The, that court well, has no faith in. Um, the, the D.C. Circuit Court yeah. opinion was authoritative, uh, magisterial, and unanimous with two Democratic-nominated uh, judges, one Republican-nominated judge, and um, they rightfully said that the claim that the president of the United States can engage in crimes while in office and then not be prosecuted for them ever unless first impeached and convicted is a direct uh, assault and affront to the Constitution of the United States. We have no kings here. We have no dictators. We have no czars. And uh, when Trump's lawyers answered that, yes, the president could order a SEAL team to go out and assassinate political opponents and could not be prosecuted for murder unless first impeached and convicted in the Senate, something that has never happened in our history, um, that was a statement of complete lawlessness and an aspiration for dictatorship. If you think about it, if, if what they're saying is the president can order assassinations of rivals or anybody he doesn't like for whatever reason and then can't be prosecuted unless first impeached by the House and convicted by the Senate, it's a great incentive to start murdering members of the House and the Senate <laughs> because you could deny the majority that could theoretically convict you, right? Um, and so I don't think this is the, the beginning of, of an ambiguous legal question. This is, to me, absolutely clear. They should have just allowed the D.C. Circuit Court ruling to stand or they should have summarily affirmed it and not allow this obscene delay in a trial. It's an interference to delay, to delay justice. And I don't think the cases should be hurried up in advance of the election, but I don't think they should be slowed down in advance of the election. I think the court should let the criminal courts do their thing. 
And this is a court which has repeatedly issued rulings saying in death penalty cases, for example, um, let's stop all the judicial delay. Let's allow justice to run its course. Well, let's do the same thing here. All right. Um, in my own podcast, I'm always happy when we reach a point where we don't have to be talking about Donald Trump. And likewise, I wanted to ask you just about some current... All of this plays against the background of the threat to democracy, of course, that you've mentioned. But I, I want to get into some current pressing policy issues. Um, th this is sort of a bridge because of your constitutional kinds of concerns. Let's talk about guns uh, for a moment because we've had the rise of a whole new theory of the... It was already a big development that the Second Amendment was recognized as an individual right. But I think with January 6th and the whole struggle, we've had a uh, theoretical defense of it basically as being, I, in, you've called it the insurrectionary defense. Let me just leave it at that. What, yeah. what is it and, and what the it's hell is going on with times. guns? And the, yeah, It's so. perfect for the times, let me tell you. Um, uh, yeah. and, uh, and you can see Wait. how um, a lot of these streams of our political development are now merging, yeah. right? Um, Every time that there's uh, another massacre, it could be a grocery store in Buffalo, it could be a Walmart in El Paso, Texas, it could be the um, Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston, South Carolina, it could be in your hometown in Pittsburgh <laughs> at the Tree of Life Synagogue. Yeah. Um, wherever it is, I've noticed that the same thing happens on the floor of the House and the Senate. The Democrats will show up, they will say this is uncivilized, this is an outrage, it's a breach of the social contract, we need to act, we need a universal violent criminal background check to close the loopholes in the Brady Law so people can't obtain guns online or at private gun shows without a background check. We say it's time to get rid of AR-15, the weapon of choice of the mass murderers who show up in the shopping malls and the theater center in Las Vegas where I was two days ago. Um, and um, then our colleagues across the aisle, they will get up um, with T and P, thoughts and prayers, just to save time. Uh, and they say, there's really nothing that can be done because the Second Amendment guarantees to the people <clears throat> the right to obtain whatever firearms they want because the purpose and the meaning of the Second Amendment, they say, is to give the people the right to overthrow the government if the government is to turn tyrannical. So uh, my colleague Matt Gates says the whole purpose of the Second Amendment is to give the people the power to engage in a rebellion if the government is turned tyrannical. My colleague uh, Lauren Boebert, she says, the Second Amendment's got nothing to do with hunting unless you're talking about hunting tyrants, okay? So we've got a full-blown new legal theory of the Second Amendment, which comes from the NRA when you trace it back. They're the ones who got that started. Well, um, how do we think about that? Let's start with this. We've just had uh, more than 1,000 people arrested for a violent insurrection against the government. Have any of them had charges dismissed because of their constitutional right to overthrow the government, their constitutional right to attack the police, none. I know this one. Yeah. No, no convictions. <laughs> no convictions reversed. Uh, no uh, indictments uh, quashed. Um, any Supreme Court rulings to this effect during the Civil War when there was an insurrection rebellion? None whatsoever. In fact, if you just read the Constitution, it completely debunks and refutes everything they're saying. Start with the Second Amendment itself. They say Raskin wants us to repeal the Second Amendment. I say, no, 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 no. I don't want you to repeal the Second Amendment. I want you to read the Second Amendment, okay? <laughs> a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Nothing in there about insurrection, rebellion, revolution, violent attacks on the government. But we can go much further than that. Check out Article 1, Section 8, Clause 14, says Congress has the power to call forth the militias of the states in order to enforce the law 
repel invasions, and suppress insurrections. Is it possible that the Constitution in one place explicitly gives Congress the power to suppress insurrections, but then in invisible ink in another part of the Constitution gives the people the power to engage in insurrections against the Union, right? Will they say, no, the people can form the militia, the people are the militia. A well-regulated militia means a militia that's regulated by the government. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 15 says the state legislatures appoint the officers of the militias, and Congress has the power to arm and organize and discipline the militias. It, the militia is an intergovernmental enterprise. The Proud Boys are not the militia. The Oath Keepers are not the militia. The Ku Klux Klan is not the militia. All 50 states have laws that ban private militias, and Congress needs to have one too. I'll give you a couple other um, places in the Constitution that decisively refute this. The Republican Guarantee Clause says Congress shall guarantee to the people of the states a Republican form of government, a representative form of government, um, and shall assist them in putting down domestic violence. Congress has a responsibility to put down domestic violence. People don't have a right to engage in domestic violence. The Treason Clause, the only place in the Constitution where a crime is defined, defines treason as levying arms against the Union or assisting the enemies thereof, giving aid and comfort to the, the enemies thereof. And I point all this stuff out to my colleagues in the Judiciary Committee or the Oversight Committee on the floor, and they only come back with two things. One, they say, well, what about Patrick Henry? Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death, which most certainly he did. It was a great bumper sticker in the 18th century, I, I suppose. <laughs> He was an anti-federalist from Virginia who voted against the Constitution. So what does that have to do with the interpretation of the Constitution? It's like if you turn to um, Jefferson Davis to interpret the meaning of the 14th Amendment or the 13th Amendment. It doesn't make any sense. And then more plausibly, but also equally wrong, they say, well, but what about the Declaration of Independence itself? And what about the American Revolution? The Declaration, Jefferson wrote, you know, when in the course of human events, um, if uh, the government turns tyrannical after a long train of abuses and usurpations, the people have the right to break from, to dissolve the bands and break from that form of government and start a new one. Yes, absolutely. But that's completely irrelevant because Jefferson never cited the Magna Carta or the British Constitution to do it, he cited natural law. And he says people naturally have a right to violently oppose a government that's oppressing them. Something that Lincoln pointed out at the time of the Civil War. He said, you've got the right to amend the Constitution if you don't like the Constitution, or you have a natural right to attack it, but that right doesn't come from the Constitution itself. He said, we don't have the only Constitution on earth that gives the people the right to attack the Constitution and overthrow the government. So if you think, for example, the 2020 presidential election um, was akin to King George's tyranny and parliamentary tyranny against the colonists instead of an election that was the most uh, secure and safe in American history, according to the Department of Homeland Security under the Trump administration, um, if you don't like the 60 federal and state court rulings, which upheld Biden's victory by more than 7 million votes, 306 to 232 in the Electoral College. If you think that that's tyranny, you've got every right to come and try to overthrow the government and raise arms against us. But if we stop you, if we catch you and we arrest you and you're prosecuted under the laws of the United States with every due process right afforded to you, but you are convicted, like Stuart Rhodes, the Yale Law School graduate and the leader of the Oath Keepers, who's going to jail for 19 years, we will put you in prison for engaging in insurrection against us. No, you don't have a right to overthrow the government of the United States, and you don't have a right to have machine guns, and you don't have a right to have AR-15s. Just read Justice Scalia's opinion in uh, District of Columbia versus Heller, 
where he determined the individual right to possess guns under the Second Amendment, but he said it's a right like every other right in the Bill of Rights cabined by the public safety, the public welfare, the public health. So he said it does not include your right to have dangerous and unusual weapons. It doesn't include your right to take guns into public schools or city halls or courthouses. No, he established our right to pass a reasonable gun safety regulation. So just read the Second Amendment. We can have perfectly constitutional gun safety regulation that saves thousands of lives a year in America. And that's what we need to do. Yeah. I, uh, I almost... I almost feel sorry for Lauren Boebert and Matt Getz. <laughs> um, okay, uh, very well. I, I just gotta say, what a tour de force and how lucky for the country that you bring all you bring, but also, you know, total in-depth constitutional knowledge. Um, I, th thank you, <laughs> I, I, Harry, thank you for saying that. And I, I will say, I mean, I, uh, I, I don't... The Constitution on a suicide pack is the other one that you might, yeah. Well, the, yeah. there is that. Um, but, I mean, I, I offer to my friends all the time, I said, let's, let's have a seminar. Yeah. I, I am now actually doing a constitutional class yeah. for the country um, because there's such That's civic true. illiteracy yeah. and such a, a demolition of critical thinking. Tell, tell people where the, you know... And so, uh, so it's with um, uh, Brian Tyler Cohen, who's yeah. in California, mm -hmm. And, uh, and we go on, and uh, I just uh, did one on the Second Amendment um, last week. I think it's going to go up this week. Uh, that really gets into all of the case law. And we're lo basically, it's looking at 10 um, right-wing fallacies and fever dreams about the Constitution and what the Constitution really stands for um, and uh, to attempt to get into it uh, in depth. And the Constitution is something that should bring us together, uh, but it means that we've got to study it and we can debate it and so on. But there, you got to start with the language of the Constitution and you, you can't just make stuff up, you know. You're not supposed to anyway. Yeah. All right, let's talk briefly about reproductive rights. Uh, there, the um, cataclysm to the country of the Dobbs opinion and, and yet in the aftermath, there seem to be certain uh, states that are totally going for it. I think about Alabama and their and the recent ruling about how IVF. Uh, you know, life begins at conception. Therefore, yeah. if you have IVF or use of an IUD or whatever, it's tantamount to murder of a human being. And there's a little sense to me of among some of these more red states that it's like you know the dog who caught the car, and what do they? How do they try to kind of get back at least a little bit. I just want, what's your sense of the trajectory we're on and whether reproductive freedom will, is gonna decline even more or kind of? Um, well, it depends on where you live. And yeah. you know, Lincoln said that America couldn't survive half slave and half free, that yeah. we were gonna become all one thing or all the other. And I am convinced it's the exact same thing here. I don't think that we can have theocratic rule for women in yeah. Alabama, and that, you gotta read that decision. I mean, because I think it's, it's got something like 37 or 38 references to God in it and about the, you know, the, the, the Christian ideology that they're really interpreting there as opposed to the Constitution. Um, but I don't think we can have half the country that's ruled um, by um, religious zealots of particular kind and then half the country that is a free choice and standing up for women's health care and reproductive freedom, I think we're going to become all one or all the other. And uh, that's why I hope this doesn't sound too partisan. I know I've been scrupulously nonpartisan all day. Uh, but, uh, I mean, this is why I'm fighting for, you know, for, uh, for the Democrats to win the House back and um, for the president, because I think that this is issue number one and the women of America are going to lead us as... Uh, President Biden pointed out at his magnificent State of the Union address where he, you know, after every law and constitutional value being trampled by the other side, I, I had to cheer President Biden for actually violating a taboo, a taboo that you don't tell the truth to the Supreme Court when they're sitting right in front of you. And, <laughs> and he did. Uh, and I, I was, I was, uh, 
I was absolutely amazed and exhilarated by it because, you know, they had written in the Dobbs decision that, um, you know, it wasn't that big a deal. Women are not without political and electoral power. And he said, you're about to find out how much. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I appreciated that. So, I, no, I don't think it can last. But I, I think uh, it's, it goes to a broader point because as we're seeing with birth control, as we're seeing with IVF, it's not just about the abortion issue. Right. Um, it spreads a lot farther than that. And, and I know this because uh, Mike Johnson, actually, I'm kind of friendly with. We served on the Judiciary Committee together for seven years, and we've debated this stuff for a long time. And I, I can give you a dozen examples of what they want to do. They came in to the uh, Judiciary Committee one day, said Texas has just endorsed the Ten Commandments. So we want to endorse the Ten Commandments. I said, gee, Mike, you know, you're a constitutional lawyer. What about the Establishment Clause? What about the clause that says no religious tests for public office? No, 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 no. Uh, the Ten Commandments, it's the cornerstone of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, and we want to uh, endorse it. So I went to the Rules Committee. I said, if we're going to put that on the floor and we're going to be voting on the Ten Commandments on the floor, we should have to vote for each commandment <laughs> separately, okay? And... And uh, you, can't, you can't vote for any commandment you've ever violated because uh, you'll be putting the name of the Lord in vain. You'll be uh, violating the third commandment while you do it. One of my colleagues said, you're making a mockery. Oh, uh, rascal. No, you're making a mockery out of the whole thing because your resolution is not just unconstitutional, it's blasphemous, too, to the people uh, who are believers. And so, you know... Um, it, it, it doesn't end with these people. Just not long ago, one of, one of the Freedom Caucus people got up and made a speech saying that uh, the moral downfall of America was in 1962 in Engel versus Vitale when the Supreme Court banned prayer in the public schools. And I got up and I said, actually, no, the Supreme Court never banned prayer in the public schools. As long as there are pop math quizzes, there will be prayer in the public schools, okay? <laughs> Any, anybody can pray whenever he or she wants to pray. It's just... The Supreme Court said back in the Warren Court era uh, that the government can't compose a script and compel you to participate in it. That's all that the Supreme Court said um, in Engel versus Vitale. But anyway, they, they want to restore prayer to the public uh, schools. They want aid going directly to churches and so on. And the reason we're the most religious uh, country on earth is precisely because we've separated church and state. I've got atheist constituents who write me letters saying, yeah, why don't you put organized prayer back in the public schools? It'll turn all the kids into atheists. <laughs> you know, so, um, <laughs> All right, let's fast forward to the very present. Uh, so I, I watched with real interest because of the work I do, the Robert Herr hearing last week, and that was about his this report on Biden. I actually don't want to go into the substance of it so much, but it was of an ilk that I think you confront now where it's theatrical. There are, it's just a war. Of, no one's listening. It's a war of sound bites on either side. And you know, it's good, you're going to have five minutes of Republicans saying their stuff and then back. Yeah. I just, I, I just want to know what it's like. You know, you're in the minority. And if politics is the art of the possible, what do you think you can achieve in these kinds of sort of theatrical um, hearings? And what, you know, about partisanship versus nonpartisanship does it, you know, evoke for, for you as a legislator? Well, there's a <laughs> lot of questions in that one. Yeah. Um, well, let me, first let me yeah. start on the hearing. I mean, that hearing obviously never should have been called. Um, the very first sentence of the report was that criminal charges are not warranted against President Biden um, in any way. And then the next paragraph was about how he offered complete and voluntary cooperation. And the next one was basically contrasting um, President Biden, who had volunteered to come and testify, and testified for two days after the October 7th terrorism he on October 8th and 9th um, and turned over all the documents. And when they found, you know, a handful of classified documents, they immediately called the archives and called the, uh, the FBI. And her, who's, you know, a, a Republican special counsel, he himself contrasted it with Donald Trump, who repeatedly denied it. 
Um, he hid documents. He destroyed documents. He tried to get his lawyer not to turn uh, documents over. And then um, when finally they subpoenaed them, turned over some of the documents and withheld the other, demonstrating complete consciousness of his guilt and his what his legal responsibility was. So I saw it as an exercise in legislative masochism that they would call him in to testify about all this stuff, but they wanted to make fun of uh, President Biden's memory. And he and Biden even got rehabilitated at that hearing because yep. of it, because a number of members read the entire um, transcript of the interview where special counsel Herr complimented Biden saying, my, you really have a photographic recall of everything that was in your house at that point, you know, but that didn't make it into the report. Um, so, I, you know, I, I, all I could say about that was, yeah, this is a memory test. It's a memory test for America, whether we remember fascism and Nazism and totalitarianism. That's what's really going on in the country today. Do we remember that? It's not a memory test for President Biden. And, um, but, you know, like the partisanship issue is interesting because I'm somebody, you know, as a professor, I start off not, or at least I started off with not very many partisan bones in my body. I mean, I really, uh, and also I'm a middle child, so I like to bring people together. And I, you know, <laughs> when I was in Annapolis in the state Senate, I was always working with Republicans um, as well as Democrats. And, you know, I guess th there's a lot of hypocrisy that all of us engage in about partisanship. Everybody denounces partisanship, like right when we're on our way to our uh, party caucus meeting, where we go and figure out how to conspire against the other side. So, you know, I, I tried to write something at some point. I'll see if I can find that and give you guys, but about partisanship. And I guess the way I see it is this, that in truth, when you think about it, political parties are a sign of health. They're kind of a sign of oxygen in a democratic political system. Because the, the alternative to partisanship is a one-party state. Vladimir Putin is what Viktor Orban wants in Hungary. It's what she's got in China, right? One easy way to get rid of partisanship is you get rid of parties. Now you got a one-party state and a dictator, right? That's not good. So political parties are a sign in our system of First Amendment freedom. People have a right to speak. They've got a right to petition government for redress of grievances, a right to assemble, right to organize, a right to run, right? Um, so that's good. And they articulate political agendas and they organize uh, public opinion in a society like ours where the government doesn't take responsibility for registering people to vote. The political parties register people to vote and get people involved. So I say two cheers for political parties, but I don't say three cheers, why? Because after the election is over, those of us who aspire and attain to public office, who are nothing but the servants of the people, in the minute that we begin to think we're kings and queens and lords and all that, that's the time to evict and eject and reject and impeach and convict and start all over again, okay? But when we're in, we've got to remember that we are not there just to represent the people who voted for us or our own party, we're there to represent everybody. And a lot of politicians will roll their eyes at this point and say, oh, you know, that's fanciful, that's, that's highfalutin academic stuff. You know that's not true. I know it is true, and I, and I tell you why. If you come to my constituent office, where I'm sure pretty much any constituent office in the country, at least I hope it's true, you need help with Social Security or Medicare or Medicaid or getting a passport or a visa, we will go to bat for you. We will move heaven and earth to get done for you whatever it is you need. And we never once ask, are you a Democrat? Are you Republican? Are you Libertarian? Are you Green? Are you Independent? We fight for you if you're my constituent. And sometimes if the constituent services aren't that good in neighboring districts, we'll help you out anyway, okay? <laughs> we'll go to work for you regardless of what your party persuasion is. So when we got over to the Senate, in the second impeachment trial, I told the senators, it's just like that. You've sworn an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, right? Without regard to political party. They took a separate oath as jurors. Literally, they took a separate oath to render impartial justice. And that word impartial resembles closely the word nonpartisan. It's really the same thing. When we want to do it, we know how to do it. And so... 
it's a sign of uh, political decadence if all of us just lapse into being our party. And I've said to my GOP friends how much I love the history of their party. But I also say, with this guy, who they've got now as their presumptive nominee, he was a Democrat a lot longer than he was a Republican. He wanted to run for president as a Reform Party person. He's a con man. He's not a Republican. He's a con man. And they, you know, they should not show him any party loyalty for what he's done. They show loyalty to their party, like Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger, by standing up for the great values of their party and not for someone who's going to exploit them. Mm. All right. We're about out of time, but can you stay another five minutes? Can we'll go for, to, so I'll let our organizers go. Uh, I want a uh, couple questions, uh, but since we're almost out of time, it's time for a lightning round, Congressman. Okay. You ready? Yes. First job. That means I can't filibuster? First job. <laughs> Time's a going. First job. My first job? Yeah. Oh, my, I, I worked at uh, Hector's Greek Restaurant uh, making gyros and french fries, yeah. Boyhood hero. Um, well, I guess, I suppose it depends on... Taking a lot of time here. Boyhood hero. I mean, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to say uh, Lincoln. Favorite spectator Bruce sport? Bruce Bernstein is still my boyhood hero. So, um... Favorite spectator sport? My, my well, uh, football. Stupid movie you could watch repeatedly? Um, probably What About Bob? Yeah. yeah. Dogs or cats? I'm a dog person, but I love the cat people, too. But, but, uh, <laughs> kind of music on your car radio? Just Bruce Springsteen, E Street radio. So, yeah. Best American political speech ever? Well, I, I'm a fan of... Uh, Lincoln's second, second inaugural, inaugural right? It's got, gotta be. And the Gettysburg Address. All right. Yeah. Something people don't know about you? Hmm. Well, I mean, I, you know, I aspire to play keyboards for the E Street Band. I, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I was just with those guys in Phoenix because you know the Springsteen's going to be there. And Time's a wasting. Tomorrow. Okay. MAGA Republican you secretly like. Oh, well, I, it's not so secret. I, I, I love Lauren Boebert. Uh, my colleagues call her Lauren Gropert, but I won't do that. Uh, and uh, I, no, I think there's, there's something to her. She's not like uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, who they call a perjury traitor queen. Yeah. Not me, but so. Um, and your favorite Southern California city near the Mexican border? <laughs> That's got to be San Diego hey. and La Jolla. <laughs> Um, I want to close by reading another passage from Unthinkable. You write that, I've learned that trauma can steal everything from you that is most precious and rip joy right out of your life. But paradoxically, it can also make you stronger and wiser and connect you more deeply to other people than you ever imagined by enabling you to touch their misfortunes and integrate their losses and pain with your own. If a person can grow through unthinkable trauma and loss, Perhaps a nation may too. Less than eight months, less than eight months, months out from an election, which implicates not just policy directions but the fate of our constitutional democracy. What gives you hope for our country's future? Mm, well, my dad used to say when we were growing up, when everything looks hopeless, you're the hope. Mm. And uh, so I grew up with that sense of guilt, I suppose. And uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I derive a lot of hope from. Uh, the great freedom fighters and democracy champions of our past, people like Tom Paine and Frederick Douglass and Susan B. Anthony and my friend Nancy Pelosi, uh, the people who hang tough. And, uh, and I derive a lot of faith from uh, this new generation. And that's why, you know, in my campaign, when I raise money, I spend no money on pollsters or consultants or TV or radio or any of it, it all goes into a school for young people called Democracy Summer. And it's been, um, it's been adopted by the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. And it's all over the country this year. So I'm hoping to get to meet thousands of these young people who give me a lot of hope because they're really, they're beyond the racism, they're beyond anti-Semitism, they're beyond immigrant bashing, they're beyond homophobia. Unfortunately, they're a little bit beyond grammar, too. <laughs> it's a, a different problem. Uh, I've got a little bone to chew with them about that. But um, really, these young people are going are gonna to save us, and we've got a lot 
uh, to learn from them. So I look to the future for hope. So. Please join me in thanking Congressman Thank Jamie you. Raskin. <laughs> Thank you, Harry. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Thank you.